On the island of Nantucket, off the watery shores of the Massachusetts coast, the Coffin family welcomed a baby girl, their second, on January 3rd of 1793. Thomas Coffin was a ship captain, and his wife, Anna, worked as a shopkeeper. While Thomas spent most of the year out at sea, it was left up to Anna to support the family, even financially. It is this example of Anna Coffin, a strong, independent woman living and thriving in a man's sphere, that Lucretia Coffin, eventually Lucretia Coffin Mott, would spend the most influential years of her life watching. It's also the kind of social equality that Mott would spend the rest of her lifetime fighting to achieve. Here in these humble beginnings, an American hero of social advocacy was born. The Coffins were devout members of the Society of Friends, more commonly known as Quakers, and it was this offshoot of Christianity that played a fundamental role in molding Lucretia Mott's future beliefs, just as much as her mother's example had. The Quaker religion promoted equality between men and women, permitting female members to speak during meetings, and even allowing them to eventually become preachers themselves. The religion endowed in Mott a sense of confidence as a female looking to speak her mind, and with its ideas concerning complete human equality, Mott would develop great exception to many social injustices, including slavery, which was so rampant in the United States at the time. She saw slavery as evil, declaring that every man had a right to his own body, and that no man had a right to enslave or embrute his brother. These beliefs that stem from Quaker ideals only further developed when Mott was sent to Nine Partners, a coeducational Quaker school in upstate New York at age 13. There, Mott received an education equal to the male students and continued to expand upon her already vast intelligence. Mott eventually became an assistant teacher at the school, but was greatly affronted by the fact that the female teachers paid much less than their male counterparts. It was during this time as a teacher, however, that Lucretia met James Mott, a fellow teacher and Quaker whom Lucretia instantly connected with, and whom she ended up marrying in 1811. The Motts then left Nine Partners and moved to Philadelphia, where Lucretia's life as a true social reformer would begin. Philadelphia was a momentous city in the 19th century, a socially active center of ideas and commerce that harbored some of the time's greatest social advocates, especially in the case of abolition. When Mott arrived with her husband in 1811, then only 18 years old, she proved undaunted by the city and its great prestige. Instead, the young Mott quickly immersed herself in both gender spheres of society. She bore six children by 1828, but continued her public role in the Quaker religion. She spoke frequently at meetings and was eventually ordained a minister in 1821. She became known for her simple but powerful sermons, especially on the issue of slavery. When the Quaker religion suffered a great schism in 1828, the Mott sided with the Hicksite branch, which was considered the more progressive and socially active group. These religious roots never separated from Mott, even as she took her on secular issues. In many of her sermons and speeches, Mott relied heavily on arguments of morality, for it was, according to scholar Dana Green, appeals to reason and especially to moral principle that were for the Mott's essential motivators of reformist activity. Her public discourse was greatly immersed in the prophetic tradition. Mott proclaimed during one of her sermons that our weapons were drawn only from the armory of truth. They were those of faith and hope and love. They were those of moral indignation strongly expressed against wrong. Mott's early preaching about slavery focused mostly on urging others to boycott against slave-made products. But as her voice became more prominent in Philadelphia society, she caught the attention of lead abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who would later call her a bold and fearless thinker in the highest degree conscientious of most amiable manners and truly instructive in her conversation. It was with Garrison's support and friendship that Mott would truly embrace the abolitionist's cause. She began to expand her beliefs about abolition, fearlessly speaking out against slavery, gradual emancipation, and the fugitive slave law. She never personally claimed to be a prolific writer, which is why so little of her work came in book or pamphlet form. She much preferred giving speeches and sermons, which relied heavily on presentation and delivery, rather than complex syntax or beautiful language. She spoke plainly but with feeling. Journalist Agnes MacDonald described her rhetoric as usually of the most direct and simple character, forceful in its entire simplicity, though here and there broken by a sentence of poetic force and beauty, a thought which suddenly illuminated the theme like a shaft of light. Mott would state her beliefs with little embellishment, speaking of her life and thoughts with straightforward candor. This proclivity for oral rhetoric led to Mott's presence at many important social conventions and meetings, as well as the several speaking tours she took throughout the United States in order to preach her gospel. Mott was continuously criticized and threatened for her outspokenness, both as a female orator and as an abolitionist, but she refused to back down. 
She was never hesitant to continue with her public work, despite the threats to her safety that were a constant present throughout her career. The causes she fought for were too important for her to put aside, even for her personal well-being. With the help of Garrison, Mott founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1833, a prominent group of both black and white female abolitionists. The society began due to the exclusion of females and most other anti-slavery groups being founded at the time, a fact that caused no end of frustration for Mott. With the diverse membership of the society, Mott hoped to educate the public in understanding that abolition was not just a white man's movement. The cause drew important support from both women and African Americans. Her own work with the society and her attendance at various abolitionist conventions brought Mott in contact with many other prominent female abolitionists in Red Hearse, women like Angelina and Sarah Grimke. She met Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1840 at an anti-slavery convention in London at which they were both denied seats due to their gender. It was around this time that Mott turned her rhetorical powers towards the fight for equality, not only for slaves, but also for arguably her most well-known crusade, women's rights. The struggle of women was, in her view, also an enslavement, although not equal to the degradation of the poor black slaves. From the 1840s to the 1860s, Mott would continue to advocate for the causes she believed in. From personally confronting President John Tyler about the issue of slavery in 1841, to playing a key role in organizing the famous Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848, to traveling around America, even to slave states where she certainly was unwanted, to spread the abolitionist message. Mott's influence was vast and significant. Her power as a successful reformer came not only from her simple but strong arguments, but also from her appealing persona and her ability to capture and keep an audience's attention. A review of one of her speeches proclaimed Mott speaking as mild, winning, and attractor. Every auditor, even the strongest pro-slavery man, listened with attention, if not conviction. Mott inspired respect for the causes she chose to speak for. She devoted her life wholly and completely to public and human service. Standing before a captive audience at the 24th Annual Meeting of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in 1860, Mott, unrelenting and standing strong even in her late 60s, describes her determination and resilience perfectly in the conclusion of her speech, I am no advocate of pacifity. In a voice that rang forceful yet simple, she declared, I have no idea, because I am a non-resistant, of submitting tamely to injustice inflicted either on me or on the slave. I will oppose it with all the moral powers with which I am endowed. I am no advocate of passivity. Quakerism, as I understand it, does not mean quietism. The early friends were agitators, disturbers of the peace, and were more obnoxious in their day to charges which are now so freely made than we are. Then, as now, her words held meaning, truth, and purpose. An abolitionist, a feminist, a pacifist, a prohibitionist, an orator, a minister, and a passionate reformer, Lucretia Mott never compromised her beliefs or relented when she felt the need for change. She remained a devoted advocate for social justice until she died in 1880, surrounded by her family in Philadelphia. With her faith and conscience guiding her, she was, and continues to be, one of the most significant forces of social change in American history.